we're at the second project. And I, I presume um, you've downloaded it. We go through the same steps of uh, downloading that project. And um, installing it and loading it and typing in it. And then we load the file r intro.r. Now, this is a rather long script. And this will take us through the remainder of the day where we're going to start working more with functions and, and especially discussing how to work with data, how to, how to create data objects and so on, how to start defining our own functions um, with a particular application in mind. And that particular application is a paper which is ancient now, two years old, um, you, the worst thing I, I, I ever did was to decide to teach bioinformatics. It used to be better about five years ago when things sort of settled out. In the last five years, once again, our information half-life is about two years. So every two years I throw out at least half of all my slides of all the bioinformatics teaching. It's, it's amazing what's going on these days. So this is a one of the modern things that's going on. <clears throat> this paper was published in <coughs> 2014 in Science, Massively Parallel Single-Cell RNA-Seq for Marker-Free Decomposition of Tissues into Cell Types. Uh, what does that even mean? Anybody care to, to interpret this title? So what's RNA-Seq? What's RNA-Seq? That's sequencing RNA usually messenger RNA. That expression of a signal. Exactly. So we, we, we sequence messenger RNA, and from the counts of our individual reads, our individual sequences, we infer the concentration of mRNA molecules. Um, when, when we started teaching this workshop, microarray technology was really new and really amazing. And that's not so long ago. Nowadays, almost nobody ever still uses microarrays, even though we'll be working with microarray data in, 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 uh, tomorrow and the day after. Nowadays, almost everything is RNA-seq, because it's much easier, much more convenient. You, you have a higher dynamic range, and so on. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the amazing things that people are increasingly doing with RNA-seq is single-cell RNA-seq. And that's actually really important. Working with single cells uh, avoids the problem that our expression profiles otherwise are composites of, of an average of many cells. Well, sometimes that may be what we're interested in, but it can be very problematic if our sample is a tissue which is actually comprised of many different cell types. Then we actually don't want all of these expression profiles to be average together, but we would like to decompose them. We would like to decompose them perhaps to identify which cell types or distinguishable cell types we have in our tissue in the first place. Now in order to do that, um, given that we can do single cell uh, analysis, we also need to do that on a large scale. It's not enough to look at a, one single cell, that wouldn't help us either. Well, in some circumstances, but we want a distribution of cells. We want a distribution of individual expression profiles to learn more about what actually makes up that tissue. And ideally, we can then associate individual expression profiles with different cell types. And that's what this, um, this paper attempts. Um, it takes tissue, splenic tissue. Um, <clears throat> it applies RNA-seq to single cells in a massively parallel fashion, i.e. in an experimental setup, where you analyze many hundreds of different individual cells. And then the paper attempts to cluster these cells into different cell types, i.e. from first principles, without any markers that we would use, for example, with flow cytometry, or other knowledge, try to distinguish are there um, prototypes of cells are there similar groups of cells, similar categories of cells that we can associate with the notion of a particular cell type? So this is really amazing. Of course, we, we go through 
our knowledge of, of biology by saying, well, we have different cell types in the body and they have different behavior, and ultimately the different behavior depends on different expression patterns. But that's something we believe. I think this is an early experiment for actually showing that, actually showing that the different expression patterns are sufficient to divide the cells apart and identify the different categories. So the authors, um, and I refer to this as the, probably the, uh, Diego Atemar Haitin, or Haitin, not Jaitin. So I'll, I'll try to pronounce it Haitin. I'm sure this is Spanish. Uh, cellular diversity is thereby approached through inference of variable and dynamic pathway activity rather than a fixed pre-programmed cell type hierarchy. So this is quite exciting. So approximately this is how it works. <clears throat> You take spleen and you mush up the tissue and uh, isolate individual cells. And you wash these individual cells into a microtire plate such that on average you only have one single cell in each well. Maybe none, but hopefully never more than one. Then you lyse them and you barcode them. So barcoding is a, is a technology where you um, <clears throat> take messenger RNA, and in this case you take the poly A tail of messenger RNA and you complement that with um, some, with a complementary sequence um, with a particular barcode. So every reagent, every single well gets a different label to it, and that different label then allows to identify, once you have an R RNA-seq read, which well that read came from. And in this way, once you have the millions of reads that the typical RNA-seq experiment uh, contributes, you are able to follow the track of that particular read back to the well or to the individual cell where it came from. So this is the massively parallel part. You, you sequence lots of them at the same time, um, but <clears throat> you're able to do that in a fashion where you can then pull them uh, apart again. And after they're barcoded and, and reverse transcribed, you throw everything into the same pot because you don't need to distinguish them anymore. Um, the molecules are then distinguished via their barcode. And you throw that into your analytical pipeline, your typical high throughput <coughs> sequencer, which gives you millions and millions of reads. And you can then associate the reads back to the cells and hopefully cluster them and identify the cells. And it really works. Um, so this is, this is one of the, the key findings here. Once you start comparing cells against cells, you notice distinctly different expression patterns. So groups of cells, some groups of cells, are much more similar to each other than to all other groups of cells. This is shown in this block structure of the cell against cell comparison. So this group of cells here, is all more similar to each other than they are to other cells in that group. This is the hallmark of being able to usefully cluster, being able to usefully put a continuum of cells into different categories. And it doesn't have to look that way. Can you, can you imagine if all the expression profiles were just randomly distributed or if the cell identities was not discrete but very, very continuous and slowly varying across cell types, you simply wouldn't have that block structure. You would have a noisy plot of something, but, but not that very clear-cut block structure. So that block structure identifies cell types. And of course, once the cell types are identified, you can then say, well, these cells, we label them, we arbitrarily label them as population six in our sample here, but what are they? They come from the spleen, but are they B cells? Are they macrophages? Are they natural killer cells? What can we learn about these cells that allows us to identify where they come from? And subsequently, the authors have then been able to take these cell types, uh, project the expression differences in some way, <clears throat> and correlate that with classical um, cell sorting. And this is um, where you where, where we find um, the traditional markers 
which would traditionally have been used to identify cells and types. So um, <clears throat> we call B cells, where well, we define B cells to be cells that are CD19 positive and B220 positive and TCR, uh, TC receptor beta negative. And that's something we can identify with flow cytometry. And when we apply that to these, to, to this um, suitably displayed um, array of, of different blocks, we, we see that our B cell markers, CD19 and B220, identify something that has clustered in, in regarding the expression profiles in this group one. So this group down here is later on identified to correspond to B cells. Or if we have uh, GR1 positive, CD11, B positive, um, these are things we, we identify as monocytes, and that corresponds to the, the group uh, 6 here, and so on. <clears throat> so we can, we can find that indeed um, this clustering, which is basically made without any bias or prior assumptions, corresponds well to our traditional knowledge of what the cell types within the spleen should be. So this is a very satisfying um, link of our prior knowledge with the high throughput knowledge. Now, of course, the link isn't perfect. There are transitional uh, states here <coughs> that are not as easily identified. So ideally, in an experiment like that, you don't just want to confirm uh, what's going on, what, what you already know, but uh, you want to find something new, and on the other hand, it shouldn't look completely different from your traditional expectations, but at least have some overlap with it. So that's the ideal situation here. Now, this is published, and the data is uh, on the public record in supplementary material at Science, um, so we can download it and start working with it. And that might be a typical scenario of what some things that you might want to do in your lab. Download data from a different publication, start working with it. Or take data from your collaborator and start working with it. And there's a couple of questions which you can imagine. Now, working with it can be tricky um, because we need to download and prepare the data. And there's a number of tools which, which might uh, need to be integrated here. So we'll, we'll start basically looking at the data and getting to the point where we can actually start uh, making interpretations and some simple analysis. Now, the paper is here in this link here. And since the paper from science is, of course, not publicly available but has its copyright, I have zipped it up with a password. Enter the password, <clears throat> upon which it gets unloaded. Um, and you can then access and read the paper. Same thing with the supplementary material. and. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all we have here. Or the Excel file. Where is it? Oh yeah, I didn't zip that up. So table S3 Excel S is simply the, the Excel data. Okay. So that out of the way, let's let's start thinking about getting data into R. So, of course, the, the simplest way of getting data into R is simply typing it and assigning it to variable. And uh, presumably you've all done that in, in your introductory uh, material um, tutorial. So, um, what exactly a piece of data contains can be very variable. So, for example, if I assign the string 1 to uh, the variable x, 
this variable now contains um, is is now an object that contains a character constant or a, a character uh, here. Now, if I look at the value of x, I see that this is character because it's enclosed in in um, quotation marks. So a quoted x one is very different from uh, say I overwrite this and I simply use the number one. See, no quotation marks here. So I get a first idea of what something uh, is by simply looking into the environment and looking at the function. These things can become quite complicated though and for many purposes we need to look a little deeper into the various aspects of our objects in order to work with them productively. So there are many um, ways of looking at the properties of a function. So for example I've defined x as a single number now um, <clears throat> one of the R functions to tell me what it is is the mode. The mode of this element or, or this vector is numeric. So this is a numeric vector. Um, this numeric vector is has the type double. Basically all numbers in R have the type double, i.e. they're double position floating point numbers or double um, yeah, double position, which basically makes all of the internal R calculations um, uh, very precise. Um, the class is um, also numeric. Um, there's a <coughs> combined function for the structure, <coughs> and this tells me it's a numeric vector of simply one element. And <coughs> Does it have any attributes? Many objects have attributes, but this one does not because no attribute is defined. An attribute, for example, would be um, names of, of an R object. So if I take this and I combine all of this into a function, um, then I can have a function which gives me basically a digest of information, various um, aspects of information that's available about an R object. This is very simple because it's just a single number, but things can become more complex and complicated and you'll find where that's useful. So <clears throat> I'd like you to even though this is a simple function, I'd like you to, to save this for future reference. So you have um, a file here which is called function template. Function template.r. It's very similar to the script template that I showed you before. What I'd like you to do is to take your function template and save it as some meaningful name, for example, type info.r. And then take the body of this function, whatever you want here, and comments, um, and put that into the function template. And, or in the, the type info.r. So at the end, you should have in your folder file called function uh, sorry type info.r which is based on the function template and which will then be available then i would like you to configure your project to load sorry this is a typo here to load type info.r upon startup. We've briefly discussed on how to do things that get executed on startup. So you should figure out how to do that. And then exit when that is done, exit our studio, start it up again, and use 
file recent projects to get back to our intro. At that time, that function should be loaded and become available. So these are rather high-level instructions. This is not just step by step. You'll have to figure out how to do this. So I think we're there. Um, <clears throat> this, this kind of customization is, is really, really useful. Whenever you, you start working on a project, You'd like to have shortcuts to the paths where you keep your files. You'd like to load particular packages. You'd like to load particular functions and so on. Um, so, so this kind of work is, is useful. Now, our profile in this setting as a file within your project is a local customization. It doesn't affect the global behavior of our studio at all. So one thing that, that you would do if you if you want to have a particular customization wherever you are and whatever you're doing is to define this globally. For that, for that purpose, I would have a file perhaps called utilities.r in a resource file. And that will contain all the paths and functions and so on and so on. And then in my R profile of a particular project, I would simply source that utilities.r wherever it's located. So then you can have local customization specific to your project, global customizations specific to your overall tastes of how to work with R or R Studio, And um, this, this really makes your life easier and, and, and once again, uh, keeps your work more reproducible. <clears throat> now, let's look a little bit at uh, the data types and for that we will at first open a particular text file so where does this text file come from um, Here. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of cells that are associated characteristically, uh, a, a couple of gene names that are associated characteristically with um, particular cell types. So this is, this is an example of what unfortunately you have a lot. It's an informational dead end. It's an image. There's no good way to work with it. This is a pasted image, and I can't select that text or get at that text. Um, I started typing it by hand, then I got tired of that very quickly. And then I took that image and I uploaded it to um, an OCR online service. So OCR, optical character recognition, notionally can go through images and extract textual information. And that worked to a fashion except, you know, 90% correct. And I had to, by hand, edit the remaining 10%. And I think in the end, I would have ended up being faster if I would have done it by hand to begin with. So this is not untypical. You have data, and it's in a format where you can't really use it. The take-home message here is if you want to have your data reproducible, don't put it into images. Uh, reusable, don't put it into images. Keep it in some way, some format that the computer can, can work with it. Anyway, so this is where these names come from. And <clears throat> they are in the file figure three characteristic genes dot text. So our next task is to take this list of characteristic genes and um, get it into a text vector, i.e., into something that you know looks perhaps like a vector like this, a character vector. This one has five elements with particular gene names. So if we want to look at that in more detail, <clears throat> this is a vector um, and mode of character, type of character, and so on. 
five elements. So the challenge is um, the task, take this file and get all of these gene names into a character vector. How would you do this? So you have a text file here. Somebody's given this to you. And you want a vector like this, where all of these gene names are an element and a character vector, so that we can use them later on to work with them. Of course, what you could do is simply, you know, type this by hand. <laughs> but the question is, how can we avoid that pain? Any ideas, any suggestions? Use the read command? Read command? Use the read command is one, uh, one possibility. So read command. There are a variety of read commands that open files and uh, read them in and, and work with them. Are there essentially manual alternatives? Is there any, something else you could do? Yeah, we could copy and paste the whole thing. Well, can we? What happens if we copy that and where do we paste it to? All right, let's try that. <clears throat> okay, so I copy and paste this into an R script. Well, that's not yet very helpful. Because, you know, if I, if I assign that, nothing good is going to happen. Because, of course, it's not yet a string. So we have to make these things strings. So what happens next? Yeah, well, that's the canonical and correct way to do it. But like, we should be able to do it this way too. First, okay. So, okay. So we are here with quotes. So at first, you said put quotes around each one. At first, this already is a valid command. Now I have this value in here. But it's not yet a vector, it's just one character element. So let's assume I want a second one. By the way, <clears throat> if I select and then press quotation marks, everything that's selected goes into quotation marks. right? So, well, if I say the same thing, That's not useful because that just overwrites it. I somehow need to tie them together. C. 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 So what does C do? C is shorthand for concatenate. Now I have a character vector with two elements. And I could just continue doing that. Possible. If I just have seven of these, that's probably what I would do. If it's 12, I would already start thinking about something less painful. Something that's less painful, perhaps, is to use um, find and replace Oh, but I don't think I can, I can find and replace um, um, line breaks. Because I could find a, a line break here and, well, maybe I can. Let's see. It should be this and replace with Yeah, 
it doesn't recognize line breaks. So if I replace every single line break with this here, I would only need to add the first and the last quotation mark and, and I'd be done. In a text editor, I can do that. But um, again, this, this doesn't look very appealing. <clears throat> There's an alternative that I could think about and that starts from putting this entire thing as a quoted string. Now these are individual strings that are separated with a line break. Where does that get me? A little further? Perhaps. Because if they're all separated with the same thing, then I can split them apart on that. And there's a very convenient function called str split. Well, string split, but it's str split. <clears throat> so string split requires something to split which is its value x, and something to split on. So I can tell it that. Perhaps my long character string would be separated with blanks or with colons, or with commas, or something else, then I could enter these, whatever these are, as something to split on. So that looks nicer, except for one thing. What's this here? That's a bit unexpected. That's not what a character vector should look like. So let's see what this actually produces. <clears throat> so I take the output and I put that as input to my function type info. <coughs> and it tells me this is a list. So list is one of the way that, that R uh, can store data. We have uh, vectors, we have matrices, which are multidimensional vectors, we have data frames, and we have lists. We'll talk a little more about the differences between these a little later on, but this is a list. Um, it has to be a list because a uh, string split is a vectorized function, i.e. it doesn't only work on a single element, it also works on an array of elements. And then it, it has to produce output for every element of that array. So the first one would go into this double uh, brackets 1, the second one would go into double brackets 2, and so on. And since they're all of different length, we can't predict how long these elements are, and this is what this is why this has to be a list. But it's a list and um, that's not not exactly what I wanted. What I wanted is a single vector. So <clears throat> what I should have, what I should be using here, is a command that's insanely useful because um, very often the output of functions are lists and we don't always want them. So you can unlist them. Unlist takes an entire list and it flattens everything into one single vector. So in this case we then finally have our vector. So that's basically the, the manual way to do it and um, yeah you know it's, it's kind of hackish to work this way but sometimes hackers is fast and you don't have to think a lot, and you don't have to look up the documentation of how exactly um, the read lines or read CSV function is formatted, and so on. So this may get you to where you need to be faster. Now, <clears throat> the industry strength solution, the, the right way to do it, however, is not that. I've put that um, into 
here. Sample solution read text. <clears throat> so read the contents of a small text file into R. So the first option we talked about is enter the data one by one. You could use a text processor to replace each occurrence of a paragraph break with the string quotation mark, comma, space, quotation mark, and then wrap the string and assign it. So this was the first version. Um, you can sort of enter it by hand, but all at once, place the whole thing into quotation marks, assign it somewhere, and then use unlist and string split to assign it. But you can also use the function read lines and you can also use the function read.csv. Now these are very different functions. One is intended to simply read single lines of text, and the other ones, the other one is very useful. It reads <laughs> comma separated values. And that's often the canonical format in which you get data that you want to work with, which comes from somewhere else. Very often it is shared as CSV, comma separated values, or sometimes TSV tab separated values. There's a function in R to read CSV and there's a function to read lines. In this case with one element per line they work the same but if I would have more than one element per line I would need to use read CSV or read the individual lines and post process them by splitting them as I read them in. So if I use read lines <coughs> Um, well, this is now uneventful because it, it's just a character vector. It looks the same as it did before, obviously. If I read CSV, this is slightly different. Um, actually, I should call this Let's look at the difference here. because there's an important distinction between the two. Uh, read lines gives me a vector, and every element of that vector is one line from the input text file. But what does read CSV produce? How would you find out what it produces? Where do we find that information? Question mark read dot csv. <clears throat> so this has this data input help page uh, refers to a number of functions that have a large number of options which which are important and they're all kind of similar, all kind of in, in, in this, you know, have a similar purpose, so they're grouped in a single help page. So one help page can contain more than one function. In this case, we have read.csv here. Uh, it explains the arguments or parameters, what they are, and the differences between them, and this, the value. The value is the output of the function. That is what the function returns. The function returns a data frame. So what's a data frame? Anybody remember? What is a data frame? Well, fundamentally, as, as basic R objects, uh, we have vectors. Technically, even a single element is a vector in R. It's just a vector of length 1. But vectors can be longer. And <clears throat> we have matrices, which can be two or three or more dimensional vectors. The limitation for these is a vector can be character, it can be a floating point number, it can be an integer, it can be a Boolean, it can contain functions, any kind of R objects can be contained in a vector, but all elements in that vector have to be of the same type. So we can't mix booleans and characters and numbers. 
It all has to be of the same type. And the same thing holds for matrices, two-dimensional objects. Everything in a matrix has to be of the same type. If we don't want everything to be of the same type, we can use data frames or lists. If we want everything in a single column of the same type, data frames is what you is, is the, the convenient thing to do. So a data frame in R is very very similar to the notion of a spreadsheet that we would have, say, in Excel, for example. We have different columns of logically related information and different rows of entities that, that have the, the instances of this information. So, <clears throat> for example, a data frame can have strings as the first column and numeric values as all the other columns. The strings might be gene names and the numeric values might be expression values. And we'll come to exactly that example a little later on. However, Everything has to have the same type within a column. We can't mix types in a column. And secondly, all the columns uh, have to be of the same length. And if that's not the case, we have to use lists. Lists are completely free. We can mix and match everything we want in there as long as we can define how to address it and how to, how to identify the substructure within the list. So the list is the most flexible, but perhaps also the most idiosyncratic to work with. Um, probably for general work, most of what you do in the real world is going to be with data frames. Um, most of what we do in here is with, with vectors because we simplify, simplify things a lot. But basically, let's consider the data frame to be um, the paradigm of how we work with data in R. Now, read CSV produces a data frame. And we can see that if we compare our function type info. So this is the characteristic genes of lines, of read lines. It gives me the, the values. It tells me it's, um, it has 46 elements, and they're all um, mode character and type of character, i.e. A character vector. <clears throat> this is very different output. So the CSV is a data frame. The data frame has one column, which is v1. I didn't, I didn't um, specify a column name, so it created a default column name for me. Moreover, they have individual row numbers or row identifiers. Um, it's a data frame, 46 observations of one variable, and this one variable, v1, is a set of character elements. It's a mode type of list and the class of data frame. So this class data frame is crucial for R to recognize um, what it is, and um, then this, this class signature allows functions downstream to access these objects in the right way. So we don't have to worry about the types. Um, if somebody writes a function that in principle takes data frames as an input, it can recognize that this object is indeed a valid data frame and then just use it. So that's, that's very convenient. Um, there's an attribute here, dollar names, which is, which is the column name. And there's an attribute row names, <clears throat> which are just the individual numbers. We can change these to other values, and we'll, we'll uh, do that a little later on. OK, so these are some thoughts and observations on how to get um, simple text data into R. Now, <clears throat> we've, we've worked a little bit with, with text We've created a text vector, we've read things into a text vector, and we've used string split to break a longer string apart. Let's consolidate that a little bit. In order to label, specifically when you are working, say, with phylogenetic trees, in order to label 
genes that you compare, uh, say you got them from the database, it's often crucially important to keep track of what organism they came from. And to have concise labels um, that allows you to plot some information on, on a larger scale plot, it's often very useful to take the binomial name that can be very long and condense that into a few characteristic letters. So as a shorthand memnonic code of where this particular string came from. So I'd like you to write a function based on what you currently know that converts a binomial scientific name into a five-letter label. So if the binomial name is Homo sapiens, the label should be H-O-M-S-A. If it's Drosophila melanogaster, it should be D-R-O-M-E. So this simply generates... Are, are you projecting what we do in here out to the public? They're getting very excited about this. Okay, I... <laughs> okay. So, first, I'd like you to figure out how to do this in principle. So perhaps you start off with simply defining some string s and manipulating that and working with it and trying to figure out how do we access the individual elements, perhaps use string split, and how do we extract individual characters from these elements. Part of this is, um, I'm not telling you how to do it, because if I just tell you everything you need to do, this is not going to help you, because your real world problems are going to be different anyway. So part of the challenge here is, how do you figure out how to achieve something like that? It's pretty easy to imagine there should be a way to get characters from a word, say the first three characters, or the last five characters, but how? This is for you to figure out and thus develop your solution strategies. If you despair, uh, there's a sample solution, um, sample solution by codes, but leave that alone for now. Try to solve it on your own. This will take us into the lunch break. So this seems like an, a good opportunity to uh, revisit what we've been doing here and, and, and why and how it actually worked. So the ultimate goal of this little exercise is to help you to learn to structure a problem into individual steps and to find how to implement these individual steps in code. And we're going to try to do that again and again and again. This is really key to it. Um, in order, that, that's the beautiful thing about working with software and working with programming. In order to have any software, any program work, at first you need to structure your ideas. And usually they get a lot better when you do that. Now, well, let's have a look. Um, I'm going to open a new string, a, a new file, script file, to solve this problem. What should I do? Okay, so the first thing is, do I write a script file, or do I write a function, or do I simply write a series of commands, or what should I do? Help me out here. A function, and what would the function do? Define the function. Yes, but what would the function do? Tell me what to work on. Right, but the f what is the, the function of the function after? <laughs> <laughs> how, how would I use that function? You can split it. Split it. How would I use the function? Not what does it do. How would I use it? In the script. In the script or on the command line once it's defined. But what do I feed the function? What should the function return to me? That's my idea of how would I use it. Or when you're in Okay, so my input would be a character string, yeah. and my output would be a new character 
a new character string. Okay, so <clears throat> let's um, make a function. Give me a, a name. How would you call it? Lowercase s. Hmm? Just little s. Little s? Yeah. Usually I like to have my function names a little more explicit than that. Um, I use single single letter lowercase variables only for variables that I don't care very much about and that I simply use as, in, as intermediate placeholders. If that's not the case, spend some time to give your function and variables a name that you can immediately recognize. It may, be, it may mean more typing as you go along, but the guy who profits from that little more typing is you half a year from now when you're going to try to read and understand your code. And you look at S and, and think to yourself, well, what was S again? So <clears throat> make it explicit. There's, there's a very true rule. Code is read very much more often than it is written. So make it easy to read. So I could call this, well, since we're trying to make some binomial codes, I've called this bycode in, in uh, previous incantations of this. OK, so I need a function. And um, that function takes some input, some variable input, a parameter, right? And that could be s, just whatever goes in. s is nice here, it's just shorthand for a string. And it will, what should my function be doing? Now, if you read this little specification carefully, you may notice that this is uppercase and this is lowercase. It doesn't really matter, but for what I had in mind here, I would like to have a convert to uppercase, just because we can do that. <clears throat> um, now, if I think about it, I'd probably want to convert it to uppercase before I split it. Once I've split it into words, I'd like to retrieve the first three characters from the first word. And then I'd like to retrieve the first two characters from the second word. <clears throat> and then I look at this and say, mm, I don't like that. Because what I don't like about it is this first three and first two. It's this, you know, magic numbers. Where does that even come from? What does that mean? So. I prefer that. And after that's done, um, paste them together or assemble them together somehow and return the result. So this is how I break down my task into individual steps. Now all I need to do is to go through my little list of individual steps and execute them in code one by one and that should do my function. 
<coughs> so the first thing is called to upper. This simply converts the string s that comes in here and converts it to uppercase. Um, how do I check that this actually works? So when I, when I define some input like that and I code, I could then use the debugger and step through my function step by step and look at all the intermediate results. But what I end up usually doing in practice is I define a variable of the expected type with the same name here. And then I can just go through these, these components of my function and, and, and test them. So I'll make a little s. Um, what's your favorite organism that we haven't used so far? Something new? Gorilla. Gorilla. Oh, that's such a nice. OK, so this is my s now. Good. So does this work? Test it here. Yeah, this gives me the expected result. So you see S is gorilla gorilla, and if I execute <coughs> the whole line, now my S has changed and is now all uppercase. Good. Next step, split the input into words. What should I be writing? String split. String split. String split. Str -split what? split S and split split on the blank character. Okay. And that, as I see, gives me a list. So what I'd also like is to unlist this. Now, this now gives me a vector with two elements. And I can access the individual elements in the usual way with square bracket notation. So for example, I can just invent a new variable t to which I assign this. And then I can say t1. And T2. Oh, that's the same thing. Did we do something wrong? No, it's correct. It just happens to be twice the same word. So T1 and T2 in this case are identical. <clears throat> now, I don't actually have to use an intermediate variable here. The result of this, um, of this expression here is a vector. Even though it hasn't been assigned and it doesn't have a name, I can still access components from that vector with the square brackets. So if I'm desperate for writing very concise code and saving characters and lines, I might be doing something like this. I think you'll agree, though, that even though this is perfectly valid, it is also slightly opaque. So whenever I find myself doing stuff like that, I usually say, well, maybe it's time for an intermediate assignment. So assigning it to something that I actually know. Because after all, if I ever want to debug this, and everything happens in this one expression in this one line, it becomes very hard to isolate the components where things might have gone wrong. <coughs> but Valid syntax it is. I can take the output of a function and simply work with it by extracting subsets, uh, substrings, or, or whatever. OK, now our t contains two elements of a character vector, gorilla and gorilla. And I want the n first characters from the first word. So let's define what n first and n second is.
obviously you can just write the actual numbers somewhere but you know again this is magical numbers and So this is just making these two variables explicit. And of course, if I define it that way, and these numbers may appear several times in the code, if it's ever used for something else, it becomes a lot easier to change things later on. OK, but how do I get 3, or whatever n first is, characters from the first word. String trim. String trim. Okay, I haven't used this. It seems to work. Okay, what do I get here, and why? So first of all, T contains two elements, and apparently string trim operates on both elements. So first one, and then the other. Secondly, string trim takes apparently the first three letters. And that's implied. I don't actually read it. Read this here, um, that it's not the middle three letters or the last three letters, but the first three letters. But other than that, it seems to be perfectly usable. First of all, I need to make sure that it applies only to the first word. Secondly, um, I should be using n first. Of course, making sure that n first and n second are actually defined. So that seems to give me the expected result. Now, <clears throat> the canonical way that I would have used is substring. But there's an important caveat here. If you use Chinese, Japanese, or Korean characters, or actually any other characters that are encoded in Unicode, um, the characters may occupy more than one character width. So a typical Chinese character is equivalent to three um, Western characters. And functions like substring can get very confused with that and can't figure out where the actual character boundaries are. So apparently string trim takes care of that and if they're double width or triple width characters, then this is preferable. Nevertheless, I think substring is, is the canonical solution. <clears throat> substring x start and stop. So substring of the first element starting at 1 and stopping at the third letter. Or 
in a similar way. The second element I'm doing this. Right. <clears throat> now in order to, to use these further, um, we could assign them or we could also paste them together directly. Now there's there's essentially two ways, two and a half ways to paste. The first two ways are to use the function paste or paste zero. <clears throat> Sorry. Paste zero. So the difference between these two is that uh, paste by default pastes everything with um, a one blank character separation whatever you, you give it, and it can collapse things together. So paste is especially useful, actually pretty much indispensable, if you want to paste the entire contents of a vector or matrix um, and concatenate all that. For example, if you have a vector and you want to make a comma-separated values list, you can use paste on that vector and define a comma as a separating character. Um, paste zero means just collapse everything together without any intervening space. <clears throat> Probably the most versatile um, similar function is this one here, sprintf. This is a function that that um, is basically inherited from a C function, uh, the programming language C, printf, um, which is basically a formatted way to print. And it has its own inner syntax and logic with which you can get um, very, very precisely formatted output of letters and numbers and strings. So just, just to show this to you, uh, sprintf takes a string for its output, and I can put anything I want there. And then <clears throat> um, with a percent sign, I can specify the type of contents that should be placed within that string. So percent %s is for a string. I have two percent signs for percent %s. And now I need to put two variables there that correspond to these percentage signs. So I could put the result of this here and the result of that. And I get this here. So the, the first per percent s has been substituted with this substring expression, the second percent s with that substring expression. Especially <clears throat> if you want formatted output with um, various ways of numbers, where you want to control how many digits, or how many significant digits are supposed to be printed to output, and um, some explanatory text on what you're printing here, and some comments. This is usually the most convenient way to do this. This percent %s or percent %d or percent %f 1.5 or whatever these codes are, um, this is a little bit of syntax to learn, but after that you have the greatest flexibility. Now for, for our very simple purpose here, paste or paste zero should probably be the simplest way to do this. Paste zero, just paste these two together. Paste does essentially the same thing, but by default it adds a blank. So 
if I don't want the blank, I need to turn it off and define the separation character to be the empty string. So either of these work for our purposes. Um, I didn't actually know about page zero until I overheard Lauren using it this morning. <laughs> it makes sense. Um, usually, you know, I, I have a very limited memory, so I, I try to do as much as possible with as few functions that I need to remember. That doesn't always lead to the most efficient code, but um, yeah, it's, it's a certain kind of economy. So I, I, for me, it's easy to remember paste and that I can turn off the or, or specify the, the separating character. And um, generate a second um, intermediate variable and then return it. Now, returning values from functions is not actually required. If there is no explicit return statement, the function will simply return the last evaluated expression, or the result of the last evaluated expression. I never do that, though. I believe very much in making code explicit. So I like to see that at some point when I read my function, I would like it glaringly obvious what it is that's being returned. Not just as a side effect of something being evaluated inside the function, I want it there explicitly. In my mind, this makes for more readable code, and that's why I write things this way. So essentially, uh, this, this I think is it. Probably works without an error. Let's see if it works for another organism. Any, any favorite organisms there? What is everybody working on? Everybody works on Homo sapiens? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> okay. So that seems to work as expected. Now, something we didn't do here, and <clears throat> that you can add, is think about what happens if there's only if there's no blank. Will it just crash and burn, or what happens then? And if that's a possibility, how can you prevent that? What happens if there's more than two words, like Homo sapiens neanderthalensis? What do you get then? Is that what you want? Can you change it? And so on. So making sure that um, your functions don't necessarily make too strong of assumptions about what they are working with and, and are able to handle commonly expected uh, special cases, this, this is just part of the game. All right. Now, <clears throat> yeah, so in my sample solution, um, which I also posted here, I actually didn't use unlist, but I accessed um, the list elements directly. So this is the syntax for accessing the first element, list element, which is a vector, and from that vector, the first vector element. And here, the same thing. OK, let's move on. Lists. Um, <clears throat> let me skip over this list section. Um, of course, you're always welcome to revisit this, this uh, code at some point. Um, if you find that you're revisiting something and, and whatever you find in this script file makes no sense to you whatsoever and may be wrong and, and misleading, then by all means do email me and I'll, I'll, I'll try to fix it together.
But I'd like to move on to data frames. Now, <clears throat> data frames really is our, our workhorse. They're a matrix or a set of data. And this can be a list of vectors and or factors of the same length that are related. So data in the same position in the rows comes from the same experimental unit, a subject, an animal, um, a cell line, whatever. So here's an example um, for generating a data frame. So data frames are created with the command data.frame and I can specify the column names and the column contents as I um, define it. So in this case I have three genes with three in expression values and uh, two, one of these genes is induced and two of the genes are not induced. So I put that into my data frame. Now if I simply type my data frame or, or uh, this is, this is how a data frame is typically output. The column names are listed, um, and these are the individual rows. As you see, if we use our function type info, the columns actually have different types. <clears throat> so the first one is a set of factors with three levels, ABC1, FUBAR31, and QRZ. Uh, the second column is of type numeric, and the third column is of type logical. So what is it with, with factors? Um, we don't very often run into factors these days except inadvertently. By far, the most common appearance of factors is when they come up in data frames um, where they are generated as defaults from character data. So if you read in a large file with character data, and there's, um, then all of these character data are converted into factors. Now, normally, factors are things like um, um, uh, sample and control, or male, female, or um, adult, juvenile, or these kinds of things. Categorical variable that you can apply to your data. And factors are really useful when you want to, for example, do to, when you want to do regression analysis on categorical variables. So you have a multidimensional data set, and then you want to say, well, um, does it is um, adult juvenile a good predictor for disease onset? And then you can use these factors and run a regression on them and, and find um, the predictive value. But in this case, this is not what we had intended. What we had intended was that these are genes and not factors. It doesn't make sense to specify them as factors. In fact, if our gene names are unique, we'll have exactly as many factors as we have gene names, and there's a lot of complication in that. The, com the most important complication is that internally, um, these are then stored as numbers, where the numbers point into a large list of names. So if you want to get them back out again, um, this can be very difficult. <clears throat> I've put a section on, on discussion of factors elsewhere in the script, but otherwise I'll skip over it. What I'll say here is that, by and large, usually we don't want factors when we mean strings. And therefore, it's important to add this little invocation here, strings as factors equals false, every time you create a data frame. So this is one of the inconveniences of R. And I actually do it this way. There's an alternative of turning it off globally, but then again, there's no guarantee that not some package author somewhere will actually be using factors and will be relying on the assumption that 
the factors are there by default, and then I've turned them off globally, and, and things will, will break in unpredictable ways. So again, um, being, being trying to be explicit here, I simply type strings as factors as false whenever I create a data frame, or add to data frames or convert things as data frames. So now if we do that, <clears throat> we have the same data frame, but now this is a character column and not a column of factors. So remember that whenever you read in things as a data frame, um, you should, in almost all cases, be turning strings as factors off unless you actually mean factors. One of the most common appearances of confusing factors, incidentally, is when you take an Excel spreadsheet, and there's only numbers in the Excel spreadsheet. And then you look at your type info, and you find one of the columns is turned into factors. But you expected only numbers, and they, they really should all be numeric. So what happened? But what most likely happened is that somebody entered, say, a decimal number with a European comma instead of a decimal point. Or that there was a missing value and somebody typed n slash a into that. So all of these are strings. So a number, unless you are in a European locale, a number with a comma is a string and not a number. Or um, n slash a does not mean not available. R has this here for not available, and it has the specific meaning that there's there's uh, missing data. But n slash a is simply a string. Now I've told you that in data frames, um, columns need to be of always the same type. So when the read.csv function reads in a column of data with numbers and then encounters a string, it has to do something. Can it convert the string into a number to keep the column consistent? No. Can it convert all of the other numbers into strings to keep it consistent? Yes, that it can do. So then it takes all of the numbers in the column because of this one comma, takes all the numbers, converts that into strings, and then if you didn't switch strings as factors off, everything is converted into factors. So the bottom line is it's, it's really important and, <clears throat> and worthwhile not to blindly um, rely on the conversion of data as it comes in, but to use a function like type info and explicitly check that you're getting what you think you should be having. Now, let's look at some of the expression values from the Haitin et al. paper. Um, and we'll just read in um, supplementary table 3 from the science website, which is an Excel spreadsheet. So you'll very often get data in Excel spreadsheets. And I believe this is... Actually, no, it's not unzipped. It's there in, in plain version. And it's table s3.xls. Now, I don't even know what would happen if you click on that. Um, should I try it? Is it going to crash my computer? No, it's smarter than that. It recognizes that it doesn't internally know what to do with XLS files, but it kind of recognizes the, the, the extension as an Excel spreadsheet, so it loads this into Excel. Now, <clears throat> do you want to work with Excel to look at your data? Maybe. Excel is an excellent spreadsheet program. It's a terrible statistics program. Many of Excel's statistics functions are actually wrong, and it makes horrible and ugly graphics. So Excel plots are usually, um, yeah, not very nice. So We'd like to read this data into R to actually analyze it. And a convenient way to do that is to save this file 
as why am I not? oh here comma separated values if you save an Excel spreadsheet or if it has several sheets uh, several workbooks in, in one file as comma separated values the result is a text file and the text file is something that you can read in R. Now R also has specialized functions that actually read Excel spreadsheets more explicitly but I would I would caution against that um, first of all the Excel format is is not an open format to begin with and all these programs kind of work on reverse engineering and and inferences I have no idea how robust this actually is whereas if I save something as a CSV it's very easy to then go through the CSV file and ascertain that all the numbers in one column actually are numbers and that you that you have what you have and that you actually get the values and not the formulas behind them and that nothing is affected by formatting conditional formatting or bold and italic and so on so <clears throat> unless you're actually desperate on working with some of the embedded functionality of the of the excel spreadsheet put it through a simple purifying step of text and comma separate separated values so simply open this and save it as a CSV file. If for some reason you don't have Excel uh, on your computer, there is a sample solution of the CSV file, which looks like this. This is now comma separated values. Now if we go back to this here, we might notice that there are some problems here that prevent us from reading this properly to begin with. Um, of course we have our gene names and we have expression values and we have some explanations of what these expression values mean. But we also have table S3 and we have um, a table caption here and so on. So in order to be able to read this into a data frame we'll need to get rid of some of this information. <clears throat> so, our next set of tasks is to load the data of this Excel spreadsheet into Excel and save it as a comma separated values file, examine the file with a text editor like R. R is actually not a bad text editor at all. Um, and then read the table into R and assign it to a variable. Now when I do that, um, there's additional work that I need to do with, with the table, usually, like take care of the headers and add some different column names and so on and so on. So I usually just <coughs> call my first read raw dat, a data frame with the raw data, and then after I process it, I assign it to a different name. The advantage is that usually while I work with it and, and uh, fix all the problems that it potentially has, um, I usually make mistakes and then I need to revert to the original version. And rather than read the original from file every, every time, this, this can be long because sometimes the files are very large, I keep them in memory until I'm happy with the analysis. Now, read this in with um, the function read.csv, assign it to something, and then use the function head to look at the contents of the first set of rows. You might then want to remove any unneeded header rows, so skip headers that aren't needed. Um, you might, you should give the columns different names that actually reflect the cell type. So, oops. For example, this is cell type 1, uh, which is, these are expression values for untreated, 
or two hours after stimulation with lipopolysaccharide. Lipopolysaccharide is a, is a cell surface antigen of bacteria that stimulates the innate immune response. So these cells, being immune cells, react differentially to the presence of lipopolysaccharide. So we would expect some of the genes that are important and implicated in that response to be upregulated and stimulated when you add LPS. Now this just says 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is not very useful. So perhaps go back to your paper and <clears throat> in this figure here, this is these are the Roman numerals of the cell types that this refers to, you should be able to identify which ones are B cell, which ones are macrophages, which are natural killer cells, and perhaps use meaningful column names. So, once again, the task is open this Excel file, save it as a CSV, read that CSV into an R object, and then um, give your R object, your, your data frame in R, meaningful column names to reflect the cell type and the stimulus status and analyze what you got. This is the, the great challenge of getting data into R. Ben. Yeah, just the, the column names with the uh, I want to keep all the columns, okay, I see. but um, as you'll see when you just read them in and skip over the header information, um, they'll be all mangled up or just be V1, V2, V3, right. V4. Okay. Right? So you'll need to figure out how to, how to assign column names and uh, how to skip lines that you don't want to read into your CSV object. <clears throat> the best way is trial and error. Just, code something, write it there, and watch it break, and then figure out how to fix the break. Now, regardless of where you're at at the moment, um, I'd like to briefly take you through my sample solution. Um, I hope this clarifies any remaining questions, and then you can just continue writing it up on your own. So in my sample solution here, um, it's actually called differently. Um, the first step I do is I read this into a const into a variable called raw data. Read CSV. Um, this needs the file name. Um, I tell it that I don't want to actually use a header, um, but I simply read everything in there and I specify that strings as factors are false. So now this raw data appears here. A convenient way to look at this is to click on this spreadsheet icon here and this opens the spreadsheet. But of course um, another way to look at it is um, the head function. Which by default gives me the first six lines, but I can tell it to give me, say, the first 20 lines with an extra parameter and look into my, my data more explicitly. Now, <clears throat> if I look into, into this, I see a number of problems. Since I uh, skipped the header, none of this data, none of this information is actually used as header information. But R substitutes V1, V2, V3, and so on for that. So ultimately, I want to replace this with meaningful column names. The next problem is rows 1 to 6 do not contain data, but various kinds of table headings and explanations. So I'd like to remove columns rows 1 to 6. Actually, I have to remove rows 1 to 6 if I want to treat the data below as numerical, because if there's any non-numerical data left in a column, the entire column 
cannot ever become numerical. So if there's even one character, um, the whole thing will remain character, and I can't coerce it to be numerical, which I want to do later on because I'd like to you know, subtract and compare numerical values. Um, <clears throat> there's not a single row here that I can that I can use for column names, so I'll need to invent column names somehow. If this row 6 would be unique in every cell, then I could simply take that and use that as column names. Often that's the case, and then that may be the most convenient. Here I'll actually need to make up column names. And if I look at the structure of this, um, <clears throat> then I see that all of the columns are character columns because of the way it was read in, and I need to fix that. So I need to convert the numeric columns into numeric type. Okay, so the first thing is I come up with a name, which I'll call LPSDAT, lipopolysaccharide data, and I just drop the first six rows. You might remember from the introductory <coughs> tutorial um, that if we access vectors, we put we can put indices into square brackets, and if we access data frames or matrices, two-dimensional data objects, um, the rows and columns are separated with a comma. If the space after the comma is empty or there's nothing there, then it means just take everything. Other programming languages, for example, Perl would use a star there as a wildcard. R simply uses the omission. So. Um, Moreover, if I uh, specify a vector of numbers, uh, a vector of negative numbers, then this means um, remove or drop whatever indices these numbers are. So this expression here is minus 1, minus 2, up to minus 6. And this means not row 1, not row 2, not row 3, and so on. So here we go. Okay, now this looks a little more manageable. I've, I've got rid of all the cruft, but it does start with the first data. Now the next one is that I need column names. So I'll take the cell types from figure 4 of Haitin et al. And um, <clears throat> I will concatenate that into a string vector. So the first column is genes, i.e. the gene names, then B control, B LPS, macrophage control, macrophage LPS, and so on. And the last column is the cluster in which they're assigned. So which for the first ones is one, but it gets to be different clusters then. So if I do head again, I now have genes, B control, B L P S, and so on. Right? So <clears throat> I assign call names by taking the column names of LPS dat and assigning a vector of the correct length to that. Similarly for row names. Now what's with the row names? Well, the row names, you see, these are not actually row numbers, these are row names. If they were row numbers, we would start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because these are the rows of our data frame. But they've inherited the row name from whatever they used to be previously, and there we dropped rows 1 to 6, so this starts with 7. Now this can be confusing because um, if, um, yeah, if, if I want to find a particular row and, and they're all offset by, by 7 elements, I'm, I'm more likely to be wrong. So I would like to replace the current row names with simply a sequence of numbers that start at 1 to fix this row name problem. Now, how many rows are there? The command n row gives me the number of rows. So we have 1,341 gene expression profiles here. And this range operator simply gives me the number from 1 to 1,341 which I can then assign into the row names. 
So let's look at that result again. Now it starts row 126. And just to make sure, we'll use the cognate of head to look at the back of the file, which would probably be called tail. Right, 1340, 1341, and there it ends. Okay. And I can also look at the entire type info. Here we go. Now, why are these no longer character but were correctly converted into numeric? Essentially, this happened when we dropped. Uh, the first six lines, the first six rows here. Okay, and there's no factors. We have characters in the gene column and we have the expression values. Now look at look at that sample solution. It's, it's within the files. Try to compare it with what you've been doing. Um, if there's anything that you think you have been doing more elegantly or differently and you're confused about why it's different and why I'm doing it in a particular way, let me know and let's discuss.